Dr. Mubarak Shah. I will say a few words uh, to introduce um, uh, Dr. Mubarak Shah. Um, I have known Mubarak for many, many years. Uh, he's a pioneer in computer vision and has done a lot of influential work in uh, tracking action recognition, among other things. Many of us, definitely including myself, have used, uh, for example, like a UCF 101, which was actually the work of Dr. Shah. Um, he has many other works I've followed as well. This is just one example. Dr. Shah is a, really a role model and inspiration to many of us, including myself, many of our researchers in computer vision. Well, um, Dr. Shah is a general chair for the upcoming CVPR 2022. Uh, we were just chatting that he might uh, uh, he, he, he wants to encourage people to attend, hopefully to attend the conference in person. Maybe that will become the first uh, computer vision conference uh, in person since the pandemic. Dr. Shah has won many, many uh, prestigious awards. Uh, I will not uh, enumerate them here just because it would take too long. There's uh, many, many, many prestigious awards, it's just amazing. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Shah. Okay, so now you can stop sharing and let me share this yeah. thing. Okay, can you guys uh, see it now? Yeah. Okay, so um, how do I? No. Okay, so I think part of my thing is missing here, but maybe. Oh. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I see you, so, okay, maybe that's fine. I think we'll start here. Okay, okay well, yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, um, I'm pleased to be here. And um, uh, trekking is my favorite topic. Um, I've been working um, on this topic for a long time. So uh, the title of my talk is the multi-object tracking and multi-camera tracking, just to stay with the title of the workshop. So I'm gonna talk about uh, these two topics. And so let's get started multi-object tracking. So um, this is a, like a traditional formulation um, of the multi-object tracking. So we have um, here, detection of objects, and then we have data association, we will come out tracks. So now uh, data association involves actually feature extraction, then affinity matrix computation, and then optimization. So uh, detection in the, in the old days, we used to just you know, do this detection of the points, objects, it was man mainly manual detection, a uh, single point on a person or a person's head or whole body or joints and so on. But then, you know, these automatic methods came in, DPM, YOLO, and, you know, heat map based methods. So you can do this detection automatically. Now, uh, features were also like a handcrafted features like intensity, gradients, histograms, backup words, and so on. Um, so the main work, uh, the focus was in those days that how do we compute these affinity matrix? And we used to involve these different constraints like appearance, motion, and grouping constraint and so on. And that once you get a affinity matrix, then you can you know, solve this correspondence problem. So now uh, this can be done using only two frames. Uh, which is called bipartite matching, you know, two consecutive frames. Like here we have three and fourth frame, or it can be done multiple frames, <clears throat> which has advantages that you can you know, deal with occlusion and appearing and disappearing of objects, you know, like that. And there was a lot of work, uh, including we did a lot of work on this area. 
So now to solve this um, association problem, uh, given the affinity matrix, then you can use Hungarian method for bipartite graph matching. Uh, you can use linear programming. If you have multiple frames, you can formulate it as a network flow program. And then, you know, there were lots of interesting methods. So emphasis used to be on the optimization method coming with the different constraints and so on. So then a deep learning came in. And um, um, so people started using, so let's, instead of using these handcrafted features, we can use these um, CNN features. You know, take the pre-trained ImageNet model and get the features and get affinity and then do this um, Hungarian and all other methods. So now um, what um, the question is that, well, can we actually end-to-end -end learn the affinity matrix, not just features from pre-trained and then affinity. So that's you know the topic I want to talk about. And so in this one, uh, we have feature extraction and affinity are learned together because in the previously features separate and then affinity. Um, so we have this uh, nice paper in PEMI, um, it's called Deep Affinity Network for Multiple Object Tracking. So I'm gonna talk about that, so we call it DANE. So it learns these compact features of object at several level of abstraction, and it performs extensive uh, pairing of permutation of features and accounts for multiple object appearing and disappearing. So it has these two parts. So this is first part, which is for feature extraction. So we have this pair of frames and object centers, and we pass through these um, shared weight uh, streams of convolution layers, and we get these features. And then we have these affinity estimator, which encodes affinity between the objects using their extracted features. So uh, the network looks like this and in detail. So we start with say um, first frame and it centers. So we go through the VGG. So we look at these uh, layer 16, 23 and 36, we get these features. And then we have this feature reduction, dimension reduction from 256, we get 60 and from 2512, we get 80 and so on. Now around each center of the object, we take the feature vector like this and we flatten and we put it here. This is one object, second object and so on. And we do this for all these layers. And um, we do the same thing for the second uh, image uh, and we get these cut cut of features. In addition to this VGG, we have these extra uh, five, six layers here. And that also we do the feature reduction, we get these more features. So that's why it's different level of um, hierarchy. We have these features. So all together, we get these features and get about 520 dimensional feature vector for each object. Um, and then we do this pairing. So we take say object one from first frame and we pair it with the object one from first frame and the object one, two from first frame, three frame, and we get this whole row. Then we get a second object. Again, we pair with all these, we get second row and so on. So we get this tensor and then we have additional five, six layers here and then output the affinity matrix. Okay, so we have these three. So uh, to deal with the entry exits, we uh, introduce additional row and additional column in this upstairs A1 and A2. So, um, so we have these losses. So one is the forward loss, which is the, this is the ground tooth affinity matrix and this is computed. Uh, so we just multiply these Hadamard uh, multiplication, add them up. And this is for backward. And this is uh, for the consistency because as I said, A1 is we remove the row and A2 is remove the column and we want to make sure they're consistent. And this is uh, for non maximal separation. Um, so um, the, uh, just to give a little more detail about the data association matrix. So let's say we have two frames, frame one, frame 30, and these are the uh, pages. Now, um, since um, the objects, you know, numbers 
you know, here we have four and then we have enter fifth object here and actually four objects not here. So we'll treat these a constant number of object, maximum number of objects which can appear. So that's why we have this five by five matrix here. And uh, now this one is extra the X and to make it, you know, five objects in both frames. And then we additionally have another dummy row and column to do this entry exit. Um, so doing that, then, you know, this works pretty well. These are results for mode 17. You get pretty good results at that time when we published the paper. This is on mode 15. And we also apply on this uh, vehicle tracking that I said, this is called d track, And on that also works pretty well. So these are some of the results. And you see that pretty crowded scenes and the are concentrated image. It's a pretty long sequence here. So I'll just show you little snippets um, and like that. Um, so this was about the moat. And then this is about the vehicles um, that I said. So you have bus here, the truck, and you know things like that. And um, it is, uh, Pretty, pretty nice method with the um, good results. So then summary, uh, we have this end-to-end -end learning our affinity matrix and learns compact features of objects at several levels and perform exhaustive pairing of permutational features and account for multiple objects appearing, disappearing. Now, so this was you know, 2D tracking and most of the work it has been 2D tracking. You know, we have these regular RGB videos. Now, what's becoming uh, more important is the 3D tracking, uh, which is in, in context of self-driving car, robot navigation, and so on. So also, you know, LiDAR uh, captures the 3D information in terms of point clouds. And, um, now, of course, the 3D is better than 2D because it captures the structural information or the perspective distortion. Um, and also the LiDAR is widely available now. You know, even on, on my iPhone, I have a LiDAR, iPad and LiDAR and so on. So we extended this work to um, the 3D tracking. Uh, we call it PC DEN, which is like Pine Cloud DEN. And actually this summer, we entered this competition in CBPR, uh, which was the um, the um, organized by you know this data set. They collected new data set GRDB, and actually this uh, entry one uh, was at the top of the leaderboard. So um, PC then um, so now we are going to look at the three D bounding boxes detection, and that was done done by PointNet, and. Now, as I explained earlier, that we were looking at the whole image features, then we're extracting the around the center of each object is a feature 520 dimension feature vector. But now um, this 3D LiDAR data is you know, very high dimensional. So we actually process one object at a time and sort of whole frame. And so we have say NM objects and then, you know, these are represented by 3D points. You know, we have P points for each object. And so we aggregate these features by average pooling for all these, and we get this 512 dimensional global descriptor for each, each object. And then we have to, you know, when we implement this, so we have to, you know, we were not able to use this uh, bed size of reasonable size. So we have to do the group normalization to, you know, uh, to increase the bed size and works pretty well. And um, it also reduces the training time. So it looks like this. So we have um, the frame T and frame T minus one. We get the 3D point clouds and these are different objects. So each object um, has this uh, set of 3D points and we go through this point net and they are shared for this for frame T and T minus one. And we repeat the same process, get these uh, um, feature vector, concatenation feature vector, different layers, uh, and then do the pairing. And then, you know, 
do these three losses exactly the same as we did before. And we apply this on two data set, the Kitty, which is the uh, front view autonomous driving scenario, and then GRDB, which is 360 degree view indoors and outdoors. And um, both of them use this uh, Velodyne you know, LiDAR. Now in Kitty is it just single uh, light, LiDAR and in GRDB actually they have two, two LiDARs. And um, so that's why it's captured the 360 degrees. And it was a big issue students had to take those two views and you know, stick it together using calibration and so on. So we have the number of objects now it varies. The kitty had about you know, 15 cards, maximum objects and 30 pedestrian. But the GRDB has you know, about 200 you know, people. So it was a pretty uh, big data set. So we have to adjust that. And um, then now the detections, they were available as public detection. But when we use the um, um, private detection by this method, uh, we can actually increase the performance by about 14%. And um, similarly, we had a big problem with the, the, the provided public detections from GRDB. We had to apply some threshold to remove some of those. So, um, so these are the kind of examples of indoor. So as you see, these are the you know, 3D bounding boxes. This is a camera view. And this is um, um, the outdoor uh, data. So these are, you know, the pine cloud here. Um, so this is the result on Kitty. So we do pretty well, you know, competitive to this was the best uh, um, on 83, we get about 81. Now this is what when you use these um, private detections, but if you use the public detection, the actually performance go down uh, because the detection is a problem. Um, and GRDB, uh, we went to the top and we did pretty well compared to these two other submissions. So, um, and these are the qualitative results um, for the car data set um, uh, for the kitty. And, um, and this is the results for pedestrian. Um, as you see, there are quite a few people crossing each other and so on. So it works pretty well. So in summary, we extended the DEN to PC DEN and uh, point net instead of VGG for feature extraction and process objects instead of frames due to data size. And uh, we got the state of our results on GRDB compared to results on Kitty. So now going back to <clears throat> these um, formulation of object detection, we talk about, you know, you have detection and then you do feature extraction, affinity matrix computation, you land this, and then you do this Hungarian, whatever you want to do here. Now, other interesting thing here can be that um, we can actually do detection, feature extraction, affinity matrix computation together. So that's uh, another, another, you know, end-to-end -end learning as compared to relying on detection, as you, as I mentioned, the detection, if they are not good, then performance goes down on tracking. So actually we had a nice paper last uh, ECCV about that, which is Samuel standard detection and tracking um, for multi-object tracking. So I won't have time to talk about that, but the essentially it's, you know, takes a bunch of frames and kind of extension of SSD, which is for object detection. This is for the like um, tube, um, tube detection. And within that we have these set of tracks and we estimate the motion, what class it is and also visibility. And we apply this to um, actually um, MOT and also the uh, vehicle um, tracking. Now the problem with vehicle tracking is that there's not any good data set. So we actually generated this synthetic data set uh, using this uh, Carla simulator. So there are five cities, 39 cameras and different um, easy view, ordinary view and hard view. 
and there were about 90 videos and lots of frames. And um, so this is a pretty nice data set. Um, and this is uh, some demo of that. Um, it's a pretty long video, so you can see different views. These are all synthetic. It looks pretty, pretty real here. Um, so, you know, these are the cards here and um, there's some different cities and um, there's a nice outdoor thing, yeah, mountains here. So I was thinking that, you know, as uh, was mentioned earlier, that big problem multi-object and multi-camera tracking is the data set. So maybe using some synthetic data set, maybe I think one way to get, get out of that. And this method works pretty well um, for the, um, the simultaneous detection and tracking. Uh, this is the results on the, the, the uh, D-track data set, and these are the, our Omni data set, um, uh, which was a synthetic data set. Okay, so uh, I'm done with uh, multi-object tracking. Now let me now go to multi-camera tracking. So now if you look at you know, tracking in general, um, so what we have been talking about is the stationary camera. There's one camera and the stationary, and there's a lot of work on that. You know, MOT is on that, multi-object tracking mostly. But uh, if you uh, extend this, now you can use multiple camera with overlapping field of view, because if you want to cover a large area, one camera field of view is not enough. Um, and, um, but if you don't have many cameras, actually you'll have a non-overlapping field of view with multiple camera. <clears throat> and um, so then another configuration is that you want to do tracking in a single camera, but it's a moving camera. And then you can have multiple moving cameras with overlapping field of view and multiple moving camera with non-overlapping field of view. So actually, you know, we have worked in all these areas, uh, started a long time ago. So this was our first work here that we wanted to cover a whole room with three cameras. And so problem is that, you know, when we do the tracking, so you have to assign the consistent label of the people you are tracking in all the cameras. And so that problem is called handover problem. So the way we did this, that we have these edge of field of view lines we, we calibrated so that, you know, when the person appear in red camera, so he will cross the, this red line, which is visible in the blue camera. Similarly, this edge of field of view of the green camera visible in the blue camera. So like that, we have, we have lines, then we can assign these labels, uh, you know, pretty easily. So we have here a person once appear here, assign new label, he crosses red line, he'll appear here, assign same label, and then crosses green one, assign same label. So there's second person, we assign new label, the third person assign third label, it crosses red line, green line, and so on. So then, He's going to walk the red one. Is going to walk again. So we now have the overlapping field of view, multiple camera tracking, and consistent labeling. So the next thing uh, we worked on was the non-overlapping field of view. So we have here three cameras. So this is the field of view one camera, the second one, and third one, and there's no overlap. And this is a pretty complex problem. Um, so here, so first person enters assigned first label, then this is indoor, and the other two are outdoors. The second person appear here, assigned new label, third person. Then, you know, after some time, they will go out and appear one of these um, outdoor cameras. And the challenge is to assign the same label. So again, see this same guy is applying level one. And then we will have another person appearing from other cameras, a field of view. Again, we want to assign the same level as we assigned. So here, same, assign same level two. And another fourth guy come in 
third guy. So that was pretty, pretty nice. So we had a paper in ICCV 2003. Um, and so now the, we can also do the moving objects and moving cameras. So these are the you know, animation that, you know, can we do the um, multiple camera tracking like that. So here we use this uh, epibolar geometry idea. So suppose there's an object moving in 3D and these cameras are also moving in 3D. So what uh, interesting thing is that you can actually define this epipolar geometry, which we call this temporal fundamental matrix. So the idea is that if you take these corresponding points between two sequences and they are independently moving cameras, then that can be related with this fundamental matrix. And then using this, uh, you can actually do the tracking. So here, as you see that this blue person, the same here, and the red person here is same, even though the trajectories look very different uh, because of this you know, constraint we are using. So, um, so now the, right now, what we have that typical approach for multi camera tracking is that we assume tracking in individual cameras solved, then we want to solve the handover problem or re-identification or track corresponds across the cameras. And that's what you know, I've been talking about in th these different methods. So um, now I want to end uh, my talk talking about this uh, new approach that will simultaneously solve the single camera and multiple camera tracking in a single framework, okay? And also this can, also we use the video person re-ID problem because, you know, Person ID problem is very hot area, and but you know video person ID is actually more interesting, and that can relate actually to the tracking. So which is you know which is pretty interesting here. So this is a paper we had in IJCV, and we are using this what's called the constraint dominant set idea to solve this problem. So um, we have these two parts. So within camera tracking, so let's say we have three cameras here and uh, <clears throat> these are the tracks. So subscript represent the camera and superscript represent the objects. So we have four objects here, three objects here and so on. Then we will take those tracks and each of this will become a node in this graph. And then we will have the across camera tracking. So, um, so the pipeline is we have n cameras, we do the human detection, and then from there we get these short tracklets. And then now we make a, this k part eight graph, and each of the short tracklets become a node in this graph and apply this constraint dominant set to get tracklets. Then we have a second layer where the nodes now are tracklets and we want to apply another constraint dominant set to get the tracks. And then we have a third layer where we will have these tracks as a node from different cameras, and we will apply third layer constraint dominant set to get the across camera tracking. So that's how it works. So let's look at the first layer. So, you know, same process, your human detection and data association. And what we are going to do is get this human detection, and then we will just get the short track just overlapping constraint, you know, whichever is closest we say they, they correspond. Then we apply the constant dominant set to stick these short tracklets to get the tracklets, and then finally we get the final tracks. Second layer of the constant dominant set. So um, so let's look at how we do this first layer. So these short tracklets are 15 frames long. So we have these short tracklets in the first 15 frames, another 15 frames and so on. So we make this, um, um, the k part I graph. So we connect each, these, these will become nodes and we connect them to all others, completely connected graph here. And so now on this one, we will find out the 
consistent dominant say the cluster. So maybe first cluster will be actually give us the tracklet of the one person. Then second cluster will be tracklet of the another person. And we can keep repeating. And that's the way we are going to get these tracklets. And um, so then second layer, now the nodes will become the tracklets and we want to get the tracks. And um, so that is another data association problem. Nodes become tracklets and CDSC is used to stitch tracklets. And so um, then we have the third layer. So we would repeat the same process. So let me say a little bit about dominant set. Um, so dominant set is age-weighted generalization of click and um, it is a subset of vertices which is coherent and compact. And so this is an example of dominant set. You have the three nodes, and this is a similarity between node one and two, and similarity between two and three. So this is coherent, and this is dominant set. Now we add another node four, and again, the similarity of four with one is 40, similarity of four with three is, is 41. So again, this is a dominant set. Now, when we add the fifth node, now this similarity is very different from these ones. And so this is not a dominant set. So formally, the, this is the age weighted generalizes our maximum click. And we are given the affinity matrix A. And so we want to maximize this cost function, X transpose A X. And so X is simplex. So we, this gives you a membership of the each element in the set. And this has to be summed to one and a positive. And so once we can find the maximum of this, then the support vector of that is actually dominant set and which is internally and externally coherent uh, condition for a cluster. So um, now we have notion of this constraint dominant set. So here, what the idea is that <clears throat> we will have a constraint. We want to find the set which is dominant, but it contains the constraint. So we want to have this eight as a solution in this constraint dominant set. So, so this will be one constraint dominant set, and this will be another constraint dominant set because both each of this contain the eight node eight. So that also we can find very similarly as we find the dominant set. The only thing is we have to change this. They introduce this uh, diagonal matrix S. So this contains the constraints. And um, the way we are going to do is in that diagonal matrix, we'll have one for all the vertices, which are V minus S and zero otherwise, then the same process. So um, this works pretty well. So let me now explain a little bit more how we do this cross camera track association. So let's say we have three cameras and let's say we already found these tracks for in camera one. So these are the, all the tracks, one, two, three, four, camera one. These are the tracks in camera two and camera three. Now each of the track becomes a node in this graph like this and we, also want to connect these nodes within these camera also, okay? So then we apply the constraint amino set. Let's say we say camera one is a constraint now. So we want to find our dominant set which contains some of these nodes here. So maybe the first constraint dominant set is here. So now this gives you actually a cross camera tracking because it's saying, this track, this person in camera one is the same actually, this person in camera three and this person in camera two, the track of that. And also saying that actually this track of this person was broken and so we can connect that. So, which is pretty interesting. So this will be the first dominant set. And then we can get another one now here this track is broken in camera three, so we can actually connect it also by leveraging these multiple camera correspondences. 
So we get track here, uh, set here, and like we can get a single time here. So that is when camera one was a constraint. Now we can use the camera two as a constraint and we can repeat this and then camera three as a constraint. So we'll get these kind of um, constraint sets and then we have to assimilate all those to come up with the final tracks. So we have this constraint that we want to make it at most a track should be member of only one dominant set, one camera. Second is that maximum number of sets that contain tracks should be the equal to number of cameras under consideration, which makes sense also. So doing all that, so we get pretty good results. We apply this on the Duke data set. Um, so this is a pretty large data set. Um, and unfortunately it's not available now, but so it has this overlapping field of view here and this non-overlapping field of view. So uh, eight fixed camera, about uh, <clears throat> you know 50 people um, per, per frame, about 3000 identities and so on. Um, so here are some examples. So we have camera five, camera two, and camera seven, and camera four. Now uh, you see that here the person 714 appears in camera four, and then it exited from here, then appears camera seven. It enter here and then goes like that. Then it enters here camera five and then exited here. So in all these, we have the same ID 714 and that is the multi-camera tracking, okay? So um, then we have another example, this uh, 238, so enters here and then exited from here, then camera two in this year, look very different. These are different viewpoints as you see. Then enter camera five and then exited here and so on. So there's another example, look at 212, enters like this, and then enters camera one uh, like that, and then camera two and then camera five. So it's pretty interesting. You can have this consistent ID and that's the whole idea of multiple camera tracking. Um, so these are the videos here. Um, so the, so look at the 371. So this, cam, this guy is going here and then he will appear in this camera. You are tracking him and then he will, after that, he will appear here, camera two. So um, that's the Duke data set. So the mm, performance were good. This is the, these are the metrics. And uh, so first is we want to check the within camera tracking. And at that time, when we did that, there was only one method. So we do pretty well. So mostly it's mode A. And this is the hard case. Again, we do pretty well. Um, and this is about the multiple camera tracking. Um, and this is test easy. And this is much, the test hard. We do significantly better than other method. Um, now, before I end, so one thing is that this, uh, <clears throat> the re-ID uh, problem actually is, um, also sub-problem of multi-camera tracking. So if you want to do video-based person re-ID, um, so what you have, we have input clip like this, and you have a gallery like this. So you traditional method will focus on build better features, um, build a better distance metric, and then finally you rank the images or video from the gallery based on that distance. So we can apply the same method I talk about the multiple camera tracking to person ID. So we use the standard features and distance metric, extract the constant dominant set for each query and perform tracking or shortlisted clips. 
So the advantages are that we are taking a relationship between the query and elements in the gallery and elements in gallery. So here is the example. So we have input clip and this is a gallery, okay? So we again make this graph and then these are the, <clears throat> the gallery clip and this is a query and query is a constraint. So we want to find our constraint dominant say from here. And this is the one which should include a query. And then we can actually get the re-ID. So we apply this on a Mars data set, which has six synchronized uh, cameras, about 1200 IDs, uh, some distractor. And um, so suppose if this is a query, then first nearest neighbor is correct, second nearest is correct, and third one's incorrect, then fourth one's correct. And like here, first three are correct. Um, and so on. As you see, there's a lot of change of these viewpoints. So still we are able to recover this. And some more examples, here we get all correct. Again, this looks very different than the actual gallery. This is completely different viewpoint compared to this one. And uh, so on. <clears throat> so we get you know pretty good results compared to these other methods. Okay, so just summarize that we, I talk about a single framework <clears throat> for multi-target tracking multiple non-overlapping cameras. Um, there were three layers of hierarchical approach, two layers for within camera and third layer across camera. And then we can apply the same method to solve the video re-ID in multiple cameras. Um, and we got the state of art results. And we applied the on um, two data set, Duke data set and the Morse data set. So this is the, just to summarize the whole talk. I started talking about multiple object tracking and talk about the, you know, detection and data association paradigm. Um, then propose this uh, method, deep affinity network or 2D tracking, which computes the features which are useful for the affinity metrics computation. And then we extended that to point cloud then for the 3D tracking uh, LiDAR data set. And then talk about the multi-camera tracking and went through different configuration of general tracking like overlapping field of view and fixed camera, non overlapping field of view, fixed camera, and then overlapping field of view, moving cameras, and, and non overlapping field of view, moving cameras. Then talk about the this our method, constraint dominant set based method to solve this multi camera tracking problem. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, for people, if you, uh, for the audience, if you want to ask questions, please um, you can either just directly turn your microphone on the, on the talk, or you can type enter your questions uh, into the um, chat window. Uh, I will start with the first question. Uh, uh, so uh, you, you you mentioned the synthetic data and also did some experiments uh, on that. Um, I was wondering um, about the semantic, uh, sort of the, uh, the gap between the synthetic data and the, the real data. I wonder if, um, how do you see whether the method is sort of trained and tested on synthetic data that would be, how well it will work and uh, can be adapted to the real data? Could you, could you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's a pretty interesting <clears throat> question. And, you know, that used to be old question in, in computer vision. You know, we used to think that, oh, synthetic data is pretty useless. And you know, people used to, you know, kind of make fun of it. But see that with um, the learning, deep learning based method, it's amazing that synthetic data actually works so well. And um, I think um, uh, the problem is that 
real for learning you need lots of data and uh, it is not possible to get a lot of real data so this is example that the reason multi-camera tracking is not that active because there's not much data set and it's good that you guys collected this data set so i think um, the synthetic data set is pretty useful and um, it uh, actually works very close to as you have the real data so i we should you know do more of those and that will actually reduce a lot of um, burden because when it's a synthetic you <clears throat> actually don't need annotation right so all the annotations are available you have you know burning boxes and so on so that's a good direction to look into more okay thank you any any uh, any questions from uh, uh, from the audience Oh, hi, uh, okay. yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's very nice talk. Uh, so uh, in your method, I mean, you used the spatial and the temporal, I mean, relation uh, across different cameras for, for, for the tracking. Yes. <clears throat> the, um, so I talk about, you know, several things. Um, so the last method, um, was basically just using these features, you know, and features were this CNN features and so on. So the, um, <clears throat> and it was at the hierarchical manner that first you solve the short tracklet, then tracklet, and then, then you have the cross camera. So the, um, so when we build this graph, so we just have these appearance features and then motion constraint that you know we assume the constant motion we we get that so temporal features mm -hmm. are used in terms of the motion constraint um the other the previous you know method we talk about mm -hmm. um the um like um the traditionally you know the Temporal features have not been used um, in the tracking. So right? the only constraint is that, you know, how is the motion? Mm -hmm. But I think when you use the, um, instead of actually interesting point, what you are making, that if you use like in this um, um, video-based DID, right? So you have a clip, and um, you want to retrieve the similar clip from the gallery. So now there are different ways to do that. And the way I talk about it's, you know, like using the tracking method to solve the re-ID problem. So we were tracking objects and, you know, and computing features and so on. But, and those features were 2D CNN. Um, but here, you can you know also compute 3d features you know and um, so that is you know where you can include the temporal features the the other method then i talk about that we have two frames and we compute the vgg features for each frames and do that and that's a two frame uh, affinity matrix so there you cannot use a 3D features, um, but in general, I think it'll be a good idea to, we should look into how the temporal features can be also applied in solving these problems. Thank you, Ryan. Well, thank you. Um, the, uh, well, the time is uh, over. Um, so this thanks, thank uh, uh, Dr. Shah again for the nice talk. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, we'll introduce data set. Uh, um, introduce data set, and also make a winner announcement. Um, Xiaotian, can you yeah. 